Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Pettis. I serve as Director of Wellness and Population Health at Berkshire Health Systems. And welcome to the last workshop of our winter wellness series. Uh, the wellness team put together a great series and I, I hope this information has been enjoyable and educational and applicable as we all navigate the, these extraordinary times. And uh, to be the last of the winter wellness is also a good sign in that winter is almost behind us. So as the, uh, the, the spring equinox is just a few days away and the days get longer, um, that will go a long way to help us reduce some of the stress that, that we've all been holding. So I'm gonna be in the 30 minutes that we have together to share a little bit with you about the research around the stress response and how the evidence is increasingly clear that no matter what is happening in our lives, overwhelming as it can feel, that we have the ability to find the eye of the storm and to position ourselves so that we remain in the eye of that storm. And so I'm gonna uh, just bring my share screen up for you. And uh, I, I also want to remind folks that um, the Walk 150, and I'm going to uh, just very quickly bring that flyer up for you here. Uh, this is another wellness program, and I want to make sure that you are all aware of this. So the, uh, the Berkshire 150 will be a, a program uh, that I think years past, we called it Walk With Me. And uh, this is going to be from April 18th to May 29th. And if you and your friends, colleagues wanted to form a team, uh, you can register, um, and I'm sure there'll be information going out to all participants here, but you can certainly uh, register uh, online through our, our wellness page. Uh, if you go on to the health systems uh, community page, I'm sure you'll find it as well. Uh, but this should be a lot of fun. Um, and the, the goal here, of course, is to just try to get in 150 minutes a week of activity, of walking. And I know there'll be some great wellness prizes and uh, this should be a nice way to uh, kick spring uh, into full gear. And uh, let me just bring my slides up here. All right. And so happy St. Patrick's Day for those that are celebrating. And I, I was just telling Maggie, our, our uh, Zoom specialist who helps with, with all of these podcasts that uh, I, for some reason, could not find an article of green clothing today. I apologize for that. But in the spirit of uh, St. Patrick's Day, the, the great Irish novelist, James Joyce, in his story, Dubliners, referred to this gentleman uh, pictured before you, Mr. Duffy. Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And this resonates with me because I, I think when we are stressed out, we do uh, sometimes feel like we're just sort of carrying these bodies around from meeting to meeting, from task to task, uh, from all the things that we're doing as, as distracting and uh, crazy as our lives get, we just sort of forget that we're an integrated whole. And our bodies often give us clues uh, as to when our stress is becoming overwhelming, when we need to be aware of that and then scale it back uh, through some techniques. Uh, and so uh, we hold our stress in our bodies. And so, so much of stress management and resiliency and mindfulness is about cultivating an awareness of what's happening inside you and how the outside gets inside and how the inside can influence what the outside experience uh, does to us. So we'll honor St. Patrick's Day through James Joyce. And 
It is certainly true. If you've ever experienced a hurricane, uh, it, it's a phenomenal sort of meteorological system with all kinds of, of nasty activity, yet in the uh, center uh, or the eye of this storm, things are remarkably calm. You might have a, a few mile radius where it's sunny and calmer, uh, uh, only to be followed by the high winds and the gusts and the, the turbulence and the vortex. And so um, I like this metaphor because I find in my own life, uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of metaphorical hurricanes uh, that, I, that you might be dealing with, uh, work-related, uh, maybe some private things at home, relationships, so, you know, all of the many stresses we have. And sometimes when you're sucked into the vortex of the storm, it can be very hard to remain objective, to remain calm, to think more clearly, um, and to um, remind yourself that we are designed in a way that can allow us to adapt to stress in ways that can leave us feeling a bit more calm and in control. We'll look at, at some of that research. So the, the stress response, which is also called the fight flight response, is a beautiful system that's designed to turn on in response to something that's a true threat to you and to turn off quickly as soon as that threat is no longer a threat. Typical example of that is, uh, you know, I might be crossing North Street and you get into the crosswalk and you notice out of the corner of your eye that a bus is coming at you, not slowing down. It's fight flight that allows you to jump out of the way without needing to think and analyze. Uh, fight flight is not about um, analysis, it's about action and Fight flight is necessary for survival. Fight flight is necessary for performance. But like any biologic system, fight flight has a sweet spot uh, where if that activation of that system is too frequent or too prolonged and one starts to enter fight flight as the default mode where you're in it more than you're not, that's when you start to see a profound breakdown in biologic balance and health. The researchers that look at this, the neuroscientists that research this, and there's been an explosion of research in this over the last 20 years, is referred to as allostatic load. I'm gonna come back to this concept in a moment. But allostasis is the innate ability of any being, animal, human, to adapt to changes in their environment. Allostatic load is when the changes in our environment are so profound, so sustained, that our ability to adapt becomes compromised. So the goal from a self-care is not to avoid allostatic load as you know it happens uh, and it will continue to happen. The ideal situation is recognizing the ability to begin to step back and, and find more effective ways to interpret and respond so that allostatic load doesn't become overwhelming. And again, there are many great um, areas of research that I'll briefly share with you uh, demonstrating um, how this can be done. Now, this is what the fight flight response looks like. Uh, anytime we perceive a threat, our brain, you know, the, the pineal gland, which is sort of the master gland of the brain, uh, sends this corticotropin releasing hormone down to our adrenal glands that sit right on top of your kidneys and have them putting out cortisol, which is the stress hormone. The challenge in day-to-day -day life is that there are many things in our environment like traffic, or just feeling like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, which most of us have felt like throughout this pandemic, where allostatic load will overwhelm that ability. And the fight flight begins to become the dominant biology. Now we have the antidote, everything in our beautiful design has an antidote. Uh, we're, we're like a beautiful system that has software built into it that can repair damage when damage occurs. But 
activating that software uh, can require some effort. And that's what the parasympathetic system is. This is the antidote to the fight flight response. And there are many practices, some of which I'll briefly touch on that can activate this system. And it will take that fight flight cortisol response and begin to turn it down. Um, I like to think of uh, like a volume knob on a stereo where fight flight might feel like a, a Led Zeppelin, uh, you know, hard rock tune and uh, the parasympathetic tone when it's turned on, it's like bringing James Taylor on and, you know, the volumes down a little bit, just a very different uh, energy. That is the antidote to the fight flight response. Now, if you look at most public health issues, uh, and this is a lot of what I do in my integrative wellness work. If you look at most diseases, diabetes, pre-diabetes, weight-related problems, metabolic syndrome, which is high blood pressure, uh, carrying more weight around the midsection, um, pre-diabetes, you know, high cholesterol, all of these diagnoses, depression, PTSD, anxiety, autoimmunity, Alzheimer's, we know that beneath what drives these diagnoses for most is an overactive fight flight response. It's on more than it should be. And people that have a more active stress response and fight flight response are going to tend to have more inflammation. And it makes sense that if you perceive a threat and if you're feeling overwhelmed, particularly chronically, your immune system is designed, it's your defense, to try to manage whatever that threat may be. And on the African savanna, where we all evolved from and our ancient ancestors that once actually roamed that terrain, it's hard to imagine that we could go back thousands of generations and that family tree lived. You had people that were around 200,000 years ago and their environments, the threats in those environments from predators to famine to harsh weather conditions uh, were the reasons that fight flight emerged. In modern life, fight flight can take the form of getting your bills at the end of the month or dealing with a relationship challenge, dealing with a coworker that pushes your buttons, um, too much social isolation and not, not enough fun, right? Uh, so um, again, our immune systems like our fight flight system is designed to turn on and turn off quickly. For many of us with chronic stress, these things are on all the time. And this will be your passport to aging and a higher burden of chronic complex disease. And when you look at the origins, really where the root causes, the conditions of the soil in this example, is really how we eat, how we move, our socioeconomic status will influence our allostatic load, light quality. We spend much less time outdoors and more time indoors under artificial lighting. Uh, that disrupts our, our biology, can cause more inflammation and stress. Um, environmental toxins, our sleep quality, you know, social connection, traumatic events, particularly traumatic events, which can go back to very early childhood. We call these adverse childhood events. These can be profoundly um, disruptive later in life. And you see a much greater risk of these chronic diseases in individuals who struggle to find balance in these basic daily attributes. So we know that our environments and life events and certainly trauma, abuse, will create this interpretation of threat, the fight flight response creates this downstream effect and how well we adapt to that will determine how big our allostatic load is. And if your tendency is to respond to stress by eating more junk food or maybe moving less or um, struggling to maintain adequate conflict management or forgiveness, we know that that will perpetuate these fight flight responses and it becomes kind of a, a slippery slide. The challenge is how can we begin to choose in a way that can break this cycle? How can we develop tools like 
breath, meditation, walking outdoors, guided imagery, you know, thinking, imagining someone you love, someone that makes you happy. Uh, those are things that will take an environmental threat and will reduce your likelihood of interpreting that threat as a true life-threatening issue. You know, we have lots of beliefs, but the fact that we have lots of beliefs doesn't mean that they're all true. Uh, many of the threats that we believe to exist really aren't truly life-threatening. Uh, we have lots of thoughts, amazing thoughts, but the fact that we have a thought doesn't mean that the thought is true. And often our beliefs and our thoughts create these fight flight responses and force us to begin to think differently about how we believe, why we believe. Why do we interpret the way that we interpret? Is it possible that there's another way I could interpret and respond to these conditions in a way that reduces the perception of threat? Um, clinically, this might take the form of mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques or cognitive behavioral therapy are all ways of helping to alter those interpretations. Now, research that goes back now over 20 years from the late Dr. Bruce McEwen at Rockefeller University. This is, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. A typical fight flight response. This is the cortisol response. Typically it will go up with a stressor, but it tends to come down quickly in recovery. This was not meant to be on all the time. When a person has repeated hits, which is typical of 21st century living, and again, this may be hits at work, hits at home, hits in our finances, hits in poor quality light or not enough time outdoors, uh, hits in the form of social isolation. Um, you know, there are no shortage of hits. If we don't adapt and come back to full recovery, relaxation, what happens is, and, and here on the right side, this tan line, usually we adapt so that the hits don't affect us as much. The tan line doesn't go up quite as high, but if we don't adapt, we continue to have these high cortisol levels. And for those that are sort of locked into fight flight, eventually you, this is the equivalent of burnout where it's hard to even get up and start the day. It's hard to foster the energy. It's hard to, um, maintain attention, focus. And with these repeated stressors, again, if we're not finding this balance over time, this allostasis will, will accumulate and we end up with a new set point. So instead of this set point being a point of equilibrium and balance and equanimity and comfort, what you see is a higher set point where you're gonna feel stressed most of the time we might call that anxiety or depression or PTSD, um, or we may call it hypertension or prediabetes, diabetes, autoimmunity, and overzealous fight flight immunologic response. And so the challenge is to find balance between a system that is necessary for survival and being more aware that you have the antidote in terms of this parasympathetic system that you can activate. This is your friend. And the more familiar you are with it and the more comfortable you become in your ability to activate it, you can then alter the extent to which the scales become tipped toward fight flight. And so much of this has been researched in recent years. I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. Um, Dr. Herb Benson at Harvard found that individuals who practice breath work, imagery, very simple meditation techniques could alter their biology, lower their blood pressure, lower their respiratory rates, lower their heart rates in ways that we never thought was possible. And there's nothing special about these humans. They're no, they're no more talented than you or I. They just spend a little more time practicing um, these interventions that activate this parasympathetic system. And I know this is a bit technical, but this is an example of a, uh, an MRI scan of the brain. And this is the person's forehead. This is the back of the skull. When an individual is engaged in things that they love, things that leave them feeling comfortable, um, when they're engaged in 
uh, again, just being quiet at peace, some, some slow, deep breathing, you will activate these areas beneath the forehead of your brain, which then begins to release this parasympathetic system, what's called the vagus nerve, and all of that fight flight begins to subside. Excuse me, Dr. Pettis. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. We can't see your PowerPoint. Oh, no. We can only see the flyer. Oh, geez. I've been sharing my screen the whole time. Yeah, sometimes Zoom can be a little finicky. There we go. Oh, my regrets. Well, I, for, for those of I apologize. So for those of you, um, I can have Beth Piantoni or Maureen Daniels get you my slide deck. Um, so uh, maybe as you go back and, 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 and listen to the recording of this, you can have the graphics that I've been sharing with you. My bad. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Richard Davidson, and he is um, a neuroscientist at University of Wisconsin. And this fellow here is Matthew Picard, who's a, a, a Tibetan monk, uh, but he's also a molecular biologist. And he just spent three hours in this MRI machine. Anyone who's ever had an MRI of their brain knows how hard it can be to be in there for even five minutes without getting claustrophobic. Um, he spent three hours in there. And uh, when you look at um, what happens in his brain, and this is another MRI image, uh, and imagine laying on a table looking up these are just sort of cuts through the brain from the very top of the brain, working your way down more deeply. This is the forehead. This is the back of the skull. And again, what these practices have showed repeatedly is that you activate these frontal lobes behind your forehead. And that inhibits this blue area here is where our fight flight response originates. Um, and so uh, you start to see how quickly the brain responds to just these consciousness, these mindfulness practices. This is another MRI image. This is the forehead and this is the back of the skull. And these practices have, have also been shown to create new brain connections that connect the frontal lobes of the brain to these deeper fight flight centers. We call this neuroplasticity. As it turns out, you can grow new brain cells and new connections. You can also take some of those that maybe aren't working that well for you, patterns of believing, thinking, feeling, behaving, and you can literally deconstruct those patterns and build new pathways. Um, that's how these practices work to try to transform patterns of thinking, feeling, and ultimately behaving. And again, a lot of this research is consistent in their ability to activate these frontal lobes and to inhibit or relax these fight flight systems. We also know that brain waves, uh, humans are electromagnetic energetic creatures. We don't see that energy, but if you could, you would have these fields of energy extending several feet beyond your physical presence. Uh, and when you measure these energetic fields through brainwave activity, and again, this is research from Richard Davidson, uh, what you see, most of us are, during the day, we have what's called the beta wave pattern. Uh, this is sort of our active um, activity, working mode brain. If we start to relax a little bit, that will slow down some. Um, in deeper sleep at night, it slows down even more. What research is showing is that when you begin to apply, this is also true of exercise, it's also true of healthier foods, but certainly any mindfulness-based technique from yoga to meditation to Tai Chi to a walk in the woods to um, embracing someone that you love, you activate these gamma waves. These are higher energy states. Uh, and this seems to reset one's fight flight response. Uh, that 
um, ability to take fight flight and literally reset, like you were resetting your software. This is the electromagnetic equivalent of that reset. And we know that people will activate this during moments where they're feeling deep love and compassion, uh, when you're feeling calm and just undistracted, doing anything that you're passionate about. Um, and that's a great strategy for navigating life is to identify those things that you're really passionate about and try to protect more time to engage those activities. Maybe it's a hobby, maybe it's writing, maybe it's artwork, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's gardening. Um, activating passion will activate these gamma waves. Uh, we call that flow state often when you're engaged in something that you're so deeply absorbed in, you don't even feel like it's an effort. Uh, when you talk to those uh, professional athletes or dancers or musicians, they're not thinking about the performance. That would interfere with the efficacy of their performance. Uh, they get into flow state and our bodies and our minds just know what to do. They take over. So, um, you know, gratitude, connection with others, just understanding in all Eastern wise traditions that you have two selves. You have the self that is embodied, that self that you would identify by your name when you look in the mirror. And then we do have this higher self. Uh, you might call that your soul, your spirit. Um, you know, all traditions um, have uh, names and symbols for that higher self. Well, your higher self is always with you. And uh, connecting with that higher self, which is where these gamma waves emerge, requires conditions uh, that allow you to set the, that, that passion. And again, try to minimize some of the background noise of day-to-day -day life. And these are, again, very well-proven techniques that have been shown epigenetically. This is a whole other topic, but epigenetics is how your DNA, your book of life, can really be turned on and off in any moment. Anything that you may have inherited from your parents does not necessarily have to express itself because you can turn on and off switches around that gene. That's what epigenetics is. And all of these techniques from Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, um, anything that you're passionate about and absorbed in will change your DNA in that moment. It might take a depression risk and begin to minimize it. It might take a heart disease risk and begin to minimize it. It might take a diabetes risk and begin to minimize it. This acts on your DNA, fundamental, to reduce that inflammation and to reduce that fight flight and to create more plasticity in this beautiful garden that we call your brain. And as spring season approaches, this is a good time to be thinking about how you can enhance the gardening of your brain. How can you prune out some of those old belief systems or maybe those old practices that aren't serving you well? And how can you plant the seeds of different ways of thinking, believing, um, the seeds of movement, the seeds of connection, and allow these seeds to germinate and create new pathways? Um, again, all these techniques. I think one of the best and most fun is dancing. Uh, dancing has amazing research to support it. You're moving, of course. Uh, if it's music that you love, uh, that creates an even greater gamma wave state, uh, reduces that cortisol. If you're dancing with others that you love, even better. Uh, so anytime you can take advantage of this, whether you're alone, whether you're with others, I will go into my basement. I'll put my headphones on. I'll turn the lights down. I've got my playlist on my uh, iPhone. My playlist brings me back to a place and to a time that 100% of the time creates positive emotional states. And quickly, I can begin to feel my fight flight response diminishing. And the next time someone pushes my button, which inevitably will happen, I will be less likely to be responsive because now I have become familiar with conditions that allow me to get into the eye of the storm. Forgiveness, gratitude, these are all amazing practices. Um, 
I want to just leave you with this slide. Um, and, and again, I will circle back with Beth P. and Tony and Maureen Daniels from our wellness team that coordinated this and make sure you get a, a PDF copy of my slides. Um, but these are some really great researchers that are at the vanguard of this work and some awesome books. Um, there's a lot out there. These are some of my favorites. Um, I'm also a big fan of this, of this journal uh, called Scientific American Mind. Um, this is not for doctors. This is for anyone with an interest in this topic. Uh, really great stuff. And this is news to use uh, that can really change your life. So as the crocuses emerge, um, as the snow thaws, uh, this is a season of hope, of growth, of rebirth. And I would suggest to you that in this crazy 21st century life that we live in, um, you know, ours is uh, always an opportunity to step back and consider the power that we have to interpret and respond differently to the conditions of our lives. Uh, and while that may require some effort, these are all practices like any practice that with time become amazingly effective, uh, don't require a lot of time. And most of these do not require any or much expense. So I wish you well. Uh, I'm celebrating uh, uh, the spring that is approaching and I will stop here. I'm gonna stop my screen share and um, Maggie, if you're still there, I don't know if folks want to unmute themselves if they have any questions in a minute or two that we have. I know our 30 minutes are up, but I'm glad to hang around for another minute or so. Sure. Um, participants can submit questions through the Q&A feature for you. And another question, Maggie, if I put my PDF into the chat, would the participants get that? Um, I don't think you can put attachments in the chat, but okay. I'll, I'll work with Beth and Maureen to see if we can upload it to the YouTube channel. As yeah, well. it's not a big, but I, I, again, I apologize. I was not attentive on that screen share. Oh, no problem. All right. Well, um, I will wish you all well. Uh, feel free to email me uh, at mpettis at bhs1.org if you have any specific questions about anything that I shared today. And I, I thank you for your uh, participation. And um, again, I'll make sure we get this handout to you. So peace everyone. And thank you, Maggie. You're welcome, have a good day.